This is the House Health Care Committee. And this afternoon, we are um, taking testimony as background information uh, to House Bill 266, which is an incremental approach to health insurance for hearing aids. Health insurance coverage. Uh, health insurance coverage for hearing aids. <laughs> and so that folks who are listening to this or who listen to it later on YouTube can anticipate, our healthcare committee will take further testimony on House Bill 266 next Thursday, February 24th, from 9 to 10.30 a.m. And at that time, we will be hearing from some advocates for this bill and for uh, some members of the community who will benefit from this bill. Before we begin, before we go any further, uh, I want to acknowledge that we are, uh, that we have with us Corey, uh, who is on the screen and doing uh, sign language interpretation. Welcome. We appreciate your assisting us and assisting those who are watching and listening. We also have in the background, as I understand it, uh, a live transcription, a live transcriptionist, a person who is doing live transcription as well. Uh, I, I think we, what, what, what might be helpful, we determined what might be helpful is for us to each go around and simply say our name uh, with representative in front of it uh, as we go around the table so that Corey can hear our voices and hear our names. <coughs> so could we start with Representative Goldman? And I'm just going to ask you each to go around and say your name. I hope that you can hear through the mask, but it's Representative Leslie Goldman from Rockingham. Representative Art Peterson. Representative Elizabeth Burroughs of West Windsor. <laughs> Representative Ann Donahue from Northfield. And I am the chair of the committee, Representative Bill Lippert from Hinesburg. Representative Lori Houghton from Essex Junction. Representative Woodman Page from Newport. Representative Alyssa Black of Essex. Representative Mari Cordes from Lincoln. Great, thank you all. So, um, and we have uh, Mike Ferrant from Legislative Operations uh, assisting us in the background in case there's any technological issues he can help uh, problem solve for us. Thank you, Mike. So with that, I'm going to turn to uh, the agenda for this afternoon for really for the next hour. We anticipate uh, we've, we've scheduled that amount of time. I think we'll probably need that amount of time. We'll try to cover two different pieces of information, both of which are relevant to House Bill 266. One is uh, I want us to hear about the process and the recommendations around what are called essential health benefits. And this is a process that I will just acknowledge started uh, last legislative session uh, with this committee working with the Department of Financial Regulation uh, about our desire and their desire to move ahead with an assessment. And I see that, um, well, I'm, I'm gonna ask Emily Brown, I see, I'm looking, trying to see if I have Emily. Yes, why don't all the witnesses, if you come on the screen with your photos, that'd be great. Uh, Emily, Addy, and uh, Nissa. So, Emily, would you perhaps do you do you want to start, or Addy, do you want to introduce it? Because my understand, because the department, Emily Brown is from the Department of Financial Regulation. Addy Stromolo is the Deputy Commissioner of the Demark De Vermont Department of Health Access, Viva. 
Uh, Ina Bacchus is here. She's the director of healthcare reform at the Agency of Human Services. And Nissa James is also with us from DIVA. But I'm gonna turn it over to Emily and perhaps I'll turn it over to you to start because the Department of Financial Regulation, fondly known as DFR, <laughs> is, uh, has taken a significant role in moving this forward. And I believe there's also a slide deck somewhere along the way that someone may wish to share. So Emily, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um... My name is Emily Brown. I'm the Director of Finance, uh, Insurance Regulation for the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, and I'm joined, uh, as you mentioned, uh, by my colleagues, um, Addie Stromolo, Ina Bacchus, and Nissa James. And so actually what we're going to do, I'm gonna turn it over to Addie, um, who will be running through some slides. I don't know if, oh, there, I'm allowed to, to I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay. And is, is your preference that we share oh, the, that's a display question. the slides? Because we're, we're happy to, um, if that's easiest. But not now. Yeah, OK. I have it on my list, but I keep forgetting. Yeah. Sorry, we were having some technical issues in the, in the room. Our speaker vibrates and makes an odd noise occasionally. I uh, hope it's not too disturbing. It's slightly disturbing to us, but we will have it addressed by our IT staff eventually. Okay, I'm sorry, I got distracted. So uh, Emily, you're turning this over to Addie, is that? Yes, I'll be turning it over to Addie and uh, should, uh, Claire, should we share the slides that we submitted earlier or would you like us, or would you like to share them? I think if... Uh, <clears throat> will that disrupt uh, the interpreter? Uh, if the interpreter could just be spotlit when you uh, share the screen, then I will main, I will continue to be on the screen with the slides. Okay. So can we, do we know how to do that? I'm, I'm that not that was my question. Yeah, um, let, me, let me share and then see if I can spotlight. Clay, uh, Corey, do you know if that's something that the, the share, the presenter does? The person who is the host, just all you do is click on the three buttons on the top right, click on them, and then spotlight or pin should be one of those options. You are you are on the screen, Corey. <coughs> Great. With, you're in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Perfect. <laughs> and, and can I just say one other piece of introduction? The reason we're talking about essential health benefits and the reason, one of the primary reasons was that there is a strong interest in looking as to whether hearing aid services could be integrated into the essential health benefits plan, benchmark plan, which I'm, we're gonna say more about right now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Addy Strumlow, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Vermont Health Access. And Oops. as Emily said, so uh, technical issue. As soon as you started speaking, Addy, the court, the interpreter left the screen. So we uh, we need to apologies. I thought we were all set, but clearly there's something else we need to do to ensure that sign language interpretation is seen on the screen while we're doing screen sharing. Is that uh, Mike good. Front? Is there anything you can assist us with, or? Well, but we're good until Addie starts to speak and then. Um, Addie can also be spotlit and then the two of us will remain on the screen regardless of who's talking. Should I test? <clears throat> Is Corey yeah, oh, still what? on if I speak? That's no, perfect, no. yes. No. Great. No. No, oh, from our, from, well, we don't know what out in on YouTube though. So folks, this well, is- Well, maybe this... we shouldn't show slides. <laughs> we, we can just speak through the slides. Okay. Um, on YouTube, they see Corey. Is they- Corey yes. can be seen on YouTube. Yes, even Eddie, when Addie Eddie, can you speak a couple minutes? I'm getting confirmation on what is seen on YouTube. Sure. Uh, uh, testing. 
We're here to speak about essential health benefits. Just so you know, I'm watching it on YouTube and on Zoom at the same time, and it's not showing Corey. Yeah, me too. It jumps to the, this is Jen, it jumps to the committee room when somebody in the committee room talks, and then it jumps to Addie when Addie talks. So for a moment, I could see Corey. Perhaps it would be most straightforward for us not to display the slides. Yeah. Okay. For what is so, worth, this is Mike Front, and I, I agree. I think we, I think you either need to share slides or not. And I, I think with this particular issue, I would not share slides. Okay, great. I'll take them down. Okay, so we these, will. These slides will be available on the website of the House Healthcare Committee. Uh, and without trying to explain, on the legislative website, the Vermont legislature under the House Healthcare Committee. But we will provide more information as we uh, are able to assist. Now, because of Great. the spotlight feature, that's why we're seeing only Corey. one large screen. Okay, well, this is. Here we go. Here. All right, we're back. Okay, let's continue. And I think we have a, an illustration of the challenge of having full access. And that's useful for us to, to struggle with. But we, I, uh, I just apologize. I thought we had problem solved everything ahead of time, but we had not thought of everything. It could be a problem. So let's continue <laughs> and go from here. Thank you. Once again, Addie Strumolo, Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, and as you know, I'm here with my colleagues from Department of Financial Regulation and the Agency of Human Services, Office of Healthcare Reform. Um, to provide an update on a process, which as you mentioned, has been long underway related to essential health benefits. Um, I know Emily in particular has been here recently to talk about the process that DFR convened related to um, a grant opportunity and then reporting uh, out on examining additions of benefits to our essential health benefits benchmark plan. Um, so we're here to kind of pick up on that and clarify where we are in the process. We thought it would be helpful to first start with a refresher of what we're talking about when we talk about essential health benefits. Under federal law, the Affordable Care Act, uh, health plans in the individual and small group markets are required to cover certain essential health benefits. The way that the federal government defines these is by a state selected uh, essential health benefits benchmark plan. Federal regulations provide options from which states can select a benchmark plan. So the exercise that's been going on for the last year is looking at the existing benchmark plan and evaluating gaps and areas where we might want to add um, more benefits. One reason uh, that this process is, is what is used to uh, add benefits into the health insurance products is uh, that it avoids something called state defrayal. This is a federal requirement that states pay for additional insurance mandates uh, enacted after 2012. Uh, that's a feature of the Affordable Care Act. So by adding benefits through uh, a selection of a benchmark plan, we avoid that potential state cost. Instead, the cost of any additional benefit through the benchmark plan would play out in the plan design and rate development process for qualified health plans. So maybe I'll just pause there and see if there are any questions about the process itself, and then we'll get to what's happening on the state level. I think there's a lot of underlying questions that probably aren't clear to someone listening for the first time, but I think we should continue uh, because we use a lot of terms that are familiar to us, but not familiar to everyone. Uh, is Zen Golden, you have a question? I'm just wondering for clarity to say who the benchmark plan covers. Um, 
just to be clear on the population that this is addressing? That's a great question. Um, it applies to the individual and small group markets uh, in any state. And here in Vermont, as you know, we have a, a temporarily unmerged individual and small group market, um, also known as a qualified health plan market. Um, this covers about 70,000 individuals in the state. Um, and that is the population we're talking about being impacted by any changes to the benchmark plan. Thank you. That's very helpful. <laughs> So, so that's the federal framework. Um, uh, under state law, it's the Green Mountain Care Board that has the responsibility of uh, approving uh, changes or any benefits um, in that qualified health plan market. Um, and they are required to do so with recommendations from the Department of Vermont Health Access. So having gone through this uh, stakeholder group, again, convened by the Department of Financial Regulation, um, the state came together and, and put together recommendations, which we this week presented to the Green Mountain Care Board for consideration. So with respect to the benchmark plan, the federal government provides three options if, if, if a state wants to change it. One is to pick a benchmark plan from another state. The second is to replace certain categories of benefits with those from another state. And the third is kind of a generic option, which is to select a set of benefits uh, to become the state's benchmark plan. So the recommendation that we made this week is to select that federal option three. What we recommend is that the state create a new benchmark plan, again, for the qualified health plan market, which would include all the benefits in the existing benchmark plan, which is the Blue Cross and Blue Shield CDHP HMO plan. So we recommend creating that new plan and then adding uh, a, a new benefit, which is hearing aid coverage. And I'll get into the specifics of what that benefit would look like, but we see that as filling a critical gap um, in the current benchmark plan. And then the third aspect of the recommendation is that the state submit this change to the federal government for approval for plan year 2024, which is the earliest um, that we could have this change go into effect. So that, that is what's covered in the slides. And again, what we presented to the Green Mountain Care Board this week, um, as is our statutory responsibility, but I'll just reiterate, this has been a very collaborative process with our colleagues um, in the other agencies as well. The hearing aid benefit description uh, would cover an annual hearing exam for adults and children based on medical necessity, up to one hearing aid per year, every three years. There would be no age limitations, that's a federal um, limitation or restriction on having age limitations. Um, and then issuers would determine the cost share amount for each plan. And that's something that would play out in what is known as the plan design process um, that happens annually uh, and talks about what cost sharing each qualified health plan has. Some of the considerations in making this recommendation to add hearing aids are um, that we expect it to improve the quality of life for many Vermonters currently unable to afford hearing assistance, specifically improved mental well being, um, and additional uh, in support of health and economic equity. This change would close a gap in Vermont's current EHB coverage. Sorry, I started to use the abbreviation essential health benefits, known as EHB. Uh, Vermont is currently one of only two Northeast states without hearing aid coverage. Finally, as I mentioned, federal anti-discrimination regulations require that such a benefit um, when medically necessary be covered without any age limitations. Um, because I know you had testimony from Emily earlier this session about the report um, and the working group, we did want to mention that there were other benefits under consideration 
um, for addition into the benchmark plan. At this time, uh, we are not recommending those additions, but would support additional exploration for future years. Um, and Emily can speak about what that process would look like, um, a continuation of the, the actuarial work that uh, went into this, this presentation. So I, I think maybe I'll pause there um, and happy to take questions. Again, it's this, we've made the recommendation to the Green Mountain Care Board. I believe they're planning to vote in the next um, several weeks. There's a public comment period associated with that. And then, as I mentioned, the plan, if approved, the plan would be to then submit uh, for um, the application to the federal government in April for plan year 2024. Can you just say with, can you be explicit about when we say plan year 2024, what, when that coverage would start? Yes, the plan year for this market coincides with the calendar year. So we're talking about beginning January 1st, 2024. And we do not have the ability to accelerate that into any earlier plan. Is that, is that accurate? That's correct, and for two reasons. One is the federal government requires a significant runway to approve these changes. So the deadline that they have this May is for 2024. Um, that's one piece. <clears throat> the other piece is that the plan design for 2023 has actually already been approved um, by the Green Mountain Care Board. So as I know we've spoken about over the years, the, the process of designing the plans and, and that whole plan management body of work begins very early the previous plan year. I think to those, those outside of the world of insurance plan changes, uh, always find, at least I'll speak for myself, I know initially it was like, it was like I couldn't believe how far in advance one had to work to change, to impact an insurance health and health insurance plan, but uh, this this is having done the analysis, having done now the recommendations to the Green Mountain Care Board. It sounds like it's important that the Green Mountain Care Board act before the before a deadline coming up this spring. Is that correct? Correct. In order for us to get this into the twenty twenty four plan. So I, I see some questions in the room. Can we take questions and uh, and then maybe hear from Ina Backus as well from the Green Mountain. No, Ina's not from the Green Mountain Care Board. Ina's from, sorry. <laughs> Used to be, one time, once upon a time, I think. <laughs> but uh, okay, uh, questions, Representative Black. Uh, two, two very simple questions. Um, first of all, just for my own knowledge, does Vermont Medicaid currently cover Hearing aids. That's, right. that, that's actually our next topic. Oh, so we're going okay. to talk about that. All right, well, so. I'll, wait, I'll wait on that. My okay. other question is Do we have any sense of the self insured market? How much of that self insured market takes the, uh, the essential health benefit plan that is created and just moves that into their coverage as well? Great question. Yeah, I can take that one, Addie. Um, so to, to answer your question, Representative Black, uh, we don't see those plan, the plan designs for self-insured um, uh, employer groups or other self-employed groups. Um, it's usually up to that group to decide what benefits they want to uh, offer their employees. So having this benefit added could then lead an, an employer to decide that they want to offer the benefit, but it wouldn't require them to offer the hearing aid benefit. Um, and as I said, currently we don't, we're, we don't have the authority to collect those plans. Um, so we're unsure at this point, how many of those plans cover hearing aids and if, if they would decide to in the future. Can I also add to that, that I have asked, posed the same question to Blue Cross Blue Shield, who is the administrator for many of those self-insured plans. And they, they will try to give us an answer uh, in some future testimony, but I don't believe they were clear as well. Uh, also, um, I guess I'll stop there. There was another thought, which I can't remember. 
uh, uh, Representative Burroughs. Uh, just because I wasn't hearing you very well, did you say one hearing aid per ear per year? <laughs> it was every three years. So one hearing aid every three years. So a person who needs two hearing aids per no. year. Sorry, per, per, year. Year. per, per year. year, every okay. three years. That's what I misheard. Thank you. <laughs> I think we've Ironically. said we've said it we've said it several different ways. So let's let's say it again. My understanding is the recommend recommendation is one hearing aid per ear every three years. Is that the recommendation? That's correct. Okay. Is that consistent with other essential health benefit plans that you have reviewed? Emily, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, um, and I, I, I can try to pull it up quickly. Um, so when we were looking at what benefit design would make sense in Vermont, um, it was the request of stakeholders and after discussion in the working group that we align um, the benefit with Vermont Medicaid. Um, so if you look at Vermont Medicaid's current benefit, um, it, it really says that hearing aids are covered subject to medical necessity. But then when we dug a little bit deeper into how Medicaid was defining medical necessity, we discovered that uh, their current benefit design uh, allowed coverage of one hearing aid per year every three years um, as, as their kind of, uh, medical necessity determination. So we felt that it was appropriate to model, uh, the benchmark plans benefit after Vermont Medicaid. Um, just, if you'll give me one second, we did look at other, um, state hearing aid coverage and found that it varied throughout the Northeast, which is where we focused our analysis. Um, states, some states did have a 36 month uh, coverage period similar to to what we're proposing here, uh, but there were there was variation. For instance, Connecticut um, had a 24 month coverage period, uh, while New Hampshire had a 60 month uh, coverage period. So there were you know variations in either direction, um, and other benefit design uh, restrictions. For instance, um, one one state uh, excuse me one state. Uh, classified the hearing aids as BME. Some states actually had um, age limits, which aren't currently allowed. Um, but we we felt that modeling the benefit after Vermont Medicaid uh, seemed to make sense in this situation. So that's that's what we did, and that was also based on the recommendation of interested parties. And I missed an acronym which you used earlier. I think it was durable medical equipment that you were you said. In some there, states, yes, yeah, some states classify hearing aids. I believe it's Connecticut um, classifies hearing aids as durable med medical equipment or DME. Oh, DME. Okay. Okay. Um, other questions? Representative Page. Yes. I was curious to know: um, Do these hearing aids only last? Um, three years and you throw them away and then get another one. Um, do we also know uh, what type of hearing aid this is? Is this going to be the cheapest of the cheap or is it going to be, you know, middle of the road or do we have any information on, on the actual uh, hearing aid itself and the quality? Yeah, so those decisions will ultimately be up to the health insurers to decide. And again, uh, using that term medical necessity, the health insurers will be required to cover hearing aids, but then they will determine, for instance, if there's a slew of brands um, that they'll cover, that will be um, you know, part of their covered benefit. But this, this benefit recommendation we're making here does not specifically refer a brand um, or a type of hearing aid. That will probably largely be determined by the prescribing provider. Um, and then what 
what will then happen is that, um, for instance, if there's a certain type of hearing loss or, or level of, of hearing um, assistance that someone needs and that's prescribed by the provider, as long as it's medically necessary, then that should be covered. But just with all other benefits um, that are covered, usually insurers do have certain restrictions on their benefits, um, one to control costs, but then also so um, insurers can know what, what is covered and know what to expect when they're using a benefit. Uh, Representative Peterson and then Representative Goldman. Yeah, just follow oh. up on that. Thank you. Uh, follow up on that. I, I imagine you will get uh, a certain amount of money that you can uh, use to, to, to purchase a hearing. It would seem to me maybe it would be $4,000. And if you choose to get a, a, a higher quality hearing aid than that, you, it would be on you to pay the rest. Can you foresee something like that? Yeah, so I, I also just wanted to follow, sorry, the last question. Um, there was a, I just lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Oh, it will come back to me. But to answer your question, um, the ACA does not allow dollar limits um, on benefits. So uh, in the plan document, they're not allowed to say, for instance, we'll only cover um, up to $4,000. They, they have to just say hearing aids. Um, they can put cost share on hearing aids. For instance, if you, um, if you need hearing aids and you're using your insurance plan, there might be some cost share that um, will be associated with um, using that benefit. But under current law, uh, insurers are not allowed uh, to put a dollar limit. Um, and I just remembered the, the last question uh, before I forget was, do hearing aids only last three years? I think there's variation with that. I think some probably can last more than three years, but by putting um, an, an annual, uh, you know, an annual allowance or an annual number in there, like what we're proposing here, three years, you're you're then kind of taking the guesswork out for insured and the insurance company to say, okay, it's been three years, I can now get a new uh, pair of hearing aids, or if you don't need them, you can keep the ones you have. Um, I know we heard that with children, especially as your your ears grow, um, you they might lose hearing aids or need new ones, depending. So this also addresses that issue of of allowing someone who needs either replacements or maybe their hearing loss has changed um, to get a new pair every three years, but it wouldn't require them to. Okay, and just kind of delve in just a little bit deeper. You said cost share, so they're not going to restrict you to a certain make or model of hearing aid, are they? They or could. They? They, they could with their, so they might, an insurer might choose, and I believe Vermont Medicaid does this currently, um, and I'm not the expert on, on this by far, but uh, they can say we'll cover X, Y, and Z brands of hearing aids. Um, okay. But if there is a hearing aid that you need for your hearing loss, it should be covered. Um, okay. they, they shouldn't be able to, to, by restricting, for instance, to certain brands, they shouldn't be able to then ex restrict your access to hearing aids. So if you need a hearing aid, you should be able to access one regardless of brand, but I'm sure there'll be parameters around, um, just like birth control, for instance, there's certain brands that are covered um, under, you know, for contraception. And that's just a way uh, to, you know, let insureds know as well as restrict, um, or I shouldn't say restrict, but uh, util utilization management techniques that, um, you know, control costs, but also allow people to access the benefit. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Page? Yes, I realize we're, we're dealing with, uh hearing aids that fit inside the ear and that you can remove. Is there any surgical uh, tear um, or implant? Cochlear uh, implants? Yes, that might be covered or is that out of this realm? 
Yes. So uh, when we did an analysis of the current benchmark plan, it was uh, it was discovered or it it was found that cochlear implants are currently a covered benefit. Um, so under the current benchmark plan, cochlear implants are covered, and this would be adding um, the actual, as you said, the in-ear hearing aid as well as a hearing exam uh, for children and adults. And again, uh, just because I know I, questions have been posed to me as I've been trying to anticipate us taking this issue up, there, there will be and there are no, there are no restrictions by age for either the essential health benefit plan recommendation. So it's not like a different standard for children versus adults or adults for children. Correct. And I believe is that, and I wanna just confirm as well, cause we've kind of backed into hearing about the Vermont Medicaid benefit but you mentioned it and is it, is it accurate that there is not a different benefit for adults versus children in Vermont Medicaid's hearing aid service benefit? So I, I don't think I can speak to that. I don't believe there is, but Addie, do you? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I think I was speaking to someone from uh, DIVA at that oh, point. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, I mean, I'm, I was recalling a conversation that I had, but I was yes. trying to confirm, have that confirmed publicly if I'm accurate. And if I'm not accurate, I, I would want to know that. So I don't know if uh, Nissa, I think perhaps in our exchanges, you may have spoken to that or in an email exchange. Can, can you speak to that? Or I, I don't know who to address this to, Addie yes. or Nissa. We'll go ahead. Go ahead, Nissa. Thank you. For the record, Nissa James, Department of Vermont Health Access. Let me just check and make sure that everything is good on the screen and changing speakers since it's been predominantly Emily and Addie. Addie, are we okay still? I believe okay, so, great. yes. Fantastic. So there have been a couple of questions posed and my colleague at DFR has handled all of those questions beautifully. But as the chair indicated, it is, it is important for Vermont Medicaid to go on the record for yes. a couple of different confirmations. One, first and foremost, Vermont Medicaid does provide coverage for audiology services. And when we say audiology services, this means services related to the diagnosis, screening, prevention, and correction of hearing and hearing disorders. Vermont Medicaid also provides coverage for hearing aids. And this is defined in rule as meaning wearable instruments or devices to compensate for impaired hearing. Under the covered services, audiology services are further detailed to mean audiologic examination, hearing screening, hearing assessments, and diagnostic tests for hearing loss. And coverage for hearing aids comprises the categories that my DFR colleague had referred to health insurers being able to implement related to analog or digital hearing aids, plus their repair, replacement, and modification, prescriptions for hearing aid batteries. And this would be um, an area where Vermont Medicaid does provide coverage for hearing aid batteries. Fitting orientation and checking of hearing aids, and also ear molds specific to hearing aids. The second question was related to the clinical criteria that are in place for conditions for coverage of hearing aids. And specific to our clinical coverage criteria, it's for those who are over the age of 21 and have hearing loss to various degrees. For children under the age of 21, the criteria is that the hearing aid is medically necessary. And there's one point of clarification that I would like to provide related to what you heard in terms of the coverage being every three years for a hearing aid for each year. There is the ability to use a prior authorization if additional coverage needs to be explored prior to that three-year limit. So I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that because there is that three-year limit, there's not an alternative method um, for exploration if needed. I think I had all three questions, but let me stop there because I'm sure that may have generated others. 
Well, I, I would like, this is uh, the chair, Bill Lippert. I, thank you, Nissa. I, I would like to just further clarify the last statement that you made, which I think is important and helpful to understand. Am I with that there could be further coverage, if you will? Am I, maybe I want to make sure I understand that, that if there was additional significant change in hearing loss before a three-year period or something akin to that or related that you could, <coughs> there could be further, a further benefit if it was determined through a prior authorization to be medically necessary. Is that, am, am, am I understanding that even close? That's correct. Or, so this is documented in our provider manual and I can send this to the committee if it would be helpful, but uh, we do make sure that providers are aware that there is an opportunity to use the prior authorization process to submit requests if there's a, a medical necessity or clinically appropriate need um, prior to that three-year limit. So it would be the provider approaching Vermont Medicaid to make the recommendation of a medically necessary change prior to the uh, full three-year period. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, that's helpful to understand. Um, sure. Representative Page and Representative Goldman. I, I was just curious, how hard of hearing or how much hearing loss does one have to have in order to qualify for uh, assistance with, with hearing aids? Sure. So for those patients who are um, over the age of 21, the hearing loss in the better ear is greater than 30 decibels and based on an average taken at 500, 1,000, and 2,000. Uh, unilateral hearing loss uh, would also be a criteria, and that's when it's greater than 30 decibels, and it's, again, based on an average taken, or it's hearing loss in the better ear is greater than 40 decibels, but it's based on um, an average taken at slightly different, so it's 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000, or word recognition is poorer than 72%. Uh, Thank you. I think that's, uh, I, we were joking with each other a little bit that you gave us the correct answer and it's more technical than we're able to comprehend right now. So maybe <laughs> we'll, we'll explore that again another time in another way. Uh, I think Representative Goldman, you had a question, then Representative Houghton. Um, yeah, I was wondering if Diva keeps um, data on how many prior offs have been requested and how many are approved. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. That is a great question, and I'm happy to take that back and see if we could disaggregate data in our prior authorization system to break it down to that level. I would just say, as an aside, I'm guessing this is motivated in part by our committee's interest in the administrative burden of prior authorizations generally throughout the medical system. Uh, we, we have some initiatives underway. We've tried to have some initiatives underway to try to see whether they are in fact effective and useful or uh, yeah. become an administrative burden for providers. Well, or is it just, if I may, um, an opportunity to say that you do it, but it doesn't really happen either. The other side of that question. Right. Okay. Um, I think Representative Houghton has a question. Yes. I'm going to... Um, uh, change Woody's question a little bit, but maybe try to get to the same uh, goal, which like Woody, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, Nissa, do you hear complaints that it is hard for people who need hearing aids to actually receive them because of the medical necessity? Is it easy for people who need hearing aids to that's a great way to reframe the question. Um, and I will share that no, we have not received any constituent or provider complaints into the DIVA commissioner's office related to access. 
So that's first and foremost. Um, second, I would say that in consultation with um, our clinical operations team, when H266 was released, we crosswalked our coverage to what was in H266 of uh, 2021 and did not determine that that would impact what we're currently doing. Um, so that's also point two to know. And as part of that process, further getting to your question, Rep. Houghton, our chief medical officer did contact several of his colleagues who specialize in audiology to make sure that the references that we had used in determining clinical criteria as an example um, were still up to date and appropriate and there weren't recommendations for revising that clinical criteria. So for all of those reasons, I'm comfortable saying, no, we are not hearing that currently. Thank you. Okay, this is all, I think this is very helpful. And um, I think we've, did you have further questions? I'm all sorry. No, okay. May I, I'm sorry, can I just clarify? Oh, please. I just wanna make sure for those listening that that question was directed to DIVA for Medicaid. So that is the Medicaid response, not necessarily other entities, other insurers. The EHR, this whole. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Rev Houghton, Nissa James, representing Vermont Medicaid. Thank you. Right. Okay, so um, one of the questions was, uh, and this is going, actually, I don't know if Nissa has this, or Addy Stravelo has the numbers available for the number of Vermonters covered by Vermont Medicaid, this benefit in Vermont. Uh, but let, let me say what I'm interested in. And Nolan, Nolan Langwell from uh, the Joint Fiscal Office, Legislative Joint Fiscal Office is on the screen. And I had, uh, I'm anticipating, I, I'm wanting to ask him to replicate uh, a chart, which we've seen in the past, which shows which, met, which, which health insurance, types of health insurance represent how many covered lives in Vermont? Because the, the, the reason I wanted to have this as kind of uh, foundational information for taking a look at H266, which we will do next Thursday, is that we also need to understand, we all collectively need to understand, and we as legislators need to understand where the impact is currently uh, and which Vermont lives are covered by which types of insurance coverage and which parts of insurance coverage we have any impact, we can have any impact on and which we cannot and where we can have an impact, what it requires. So it, it's a much more nuanced and somewhat complicated um, framework than is necessarily obvious at the outset. And some of us have had to come to terms with that as we sit on this healthcare committee. So Nolan, if you can, if you, you understand what I'm asking, you had a pie chart in your healthcare 101 that at the time uh, had emerged small group and uh, individual market. But if you would update that for us and indicate uh, the differing numbers of Vermont lives as best, you know, in round figures. Uh, I think that would be helpful then when we look at the bill next Thursday to understand where benefits exist currently, where benefits don't exist, and et cetera, and understand where we can influence things and where we may not be able to. So uh, I appreciate, uh, thank you for, thank you, Emily, Addie, Ina, is there anything you wish to add? I'm happy to have you been with us, but we didn't direct any questions to you today. Other days, we've directed lots of questions to you. Uh, is there anything that you wish to comment on at this point? Or if not, that's fine too. Thank you for the opportunity. For the record, Ina Beckis, Director of Healthcare Reform at the Agency of Human Services, and I will only comment briefly that the uh, director of healthcare reform does have a role in this process in the coordination of the effort across uh, the agencies and departments that are involved and that we are very pleased with the process on the whole and pleased to be offering the recommendations here for you today. Thank you. 
Thank you. And th this whole process, particularly the essential health benefits process, is a has, has been, as someone said, a long time coming. Uh, this has been talked about, thought about for many years, and it was only last year as our committee inquired about what was possible as we were working and talking with the Department of Financial Regulation and the Department of Vermont Health Access that we... <laughs> Thank you for having your young person join us. It's lovely. <laughs> it, bright, it, bright, it, bright, it brightens the screen considerably. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> really lovely, really lovely. Did Brian join you? Oh no, he's right next. To you. <laughs> that's that's lovely, Ian. Thank you. Actually, uh, we we all need a good smile. Uh, but uh, just to say that the again this the process of getting to where there's a recommendation now in front of the Green Mountain Care Board for uh, updating the essential health benefits within the qualified health plans. I believe is a significant achievement and it's only it's only been able to be achieved by the incredible work from the Department of Financial Regulation from DIVA and others in the agency to coordinate all this. Uh, we will then be looking to the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, uh, hopefully to approve this change and we'll, be, we'll, we'll want to hear from them as well because uh, they ultimately have, they, there may be part of the process that I don't yet understand that will be revealed when we talk to them. So with that, uh, I think we'll, oh, and also it's, it's very useful to understand what the Medicaid, Vermont Medicaid benefit is currently and how that mirrors or interacts with the essential health benefits. So with that, I think we'll stop for this part of the afternoon Thank you all for being part of this. Thank you, Corey, for your assistance. Sorry about the bumps along the way at the beginning. We're, we will be more adept, hopefully, next Thursday. Uh, perhaps you'll join us, or perhaps one of your colleagues will. And thank you to the transcriptionist who, in the background, is making uh, what we're doing more accessible as well. With that, I'm going to suggest, Claire, that we will go off live. <laughs>